We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'd first like to thank the CARTA co-directors, uh, Jeet Varki, Margaret Schoeninger, and Rusty Gage, and the Associate Director, Pascal Ganyu. CARTA is very special to me. Um, I started changing slides and running around behind the scenes just to get access to all of the speakers when I was a graduate student starting in 2001. So it's been um, a very long love affair for me with CARTA, and I'm so pleased to see so many people here today, and I'm just thrilled to have the opportunity to talk about some of my work today. Um, my research sits at the intersection of diet composition and life history, and I was tasked with talking about um, parenting and child development. So much like some of our earlier speakers in this morning's session, as you might imagine, those are very large topics, and so I struggled with how to, how to tackle a decade's worth of research in these two very big uh, transdisciplinary fields. So um, I came up with hopefully, <laughs> a plan that will um, enable me to do so today. Humans are arguably one of the most biologically successful species on the planet. Although, I will say that some recent work on the most influential organisms in evolutionary history have the earthworm, uh, which has been around for about 500 million years, uh, outranking us. I'm not going to talk about earthworms today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about one of the reasons that we as a species have been so successful, enabling us to populate all reaches of the planet, calling even the most extreme of habitats home. Human biological success may be linked with our extraordinary ability to cooperate with one another. While cooperation is observed in many other species, human cooperation is anomalous in both nature and scale. We form long-lasting ties with both genetically related and unrelated individuals. And this cooperation is linked with our reproduction. So in order to understand parenting and cooperation, or child development, we have to consider the reproductive challenges faced by our ancestors, as well as the larger social context in which they unfolded. Human mothers have a very distinct life history compared to other primates, as we just learned, and compared to other apes. Many aspects of our reproduction are different, including a later age at first birth, relatively short interbirth intervals, or the time between each birth. We also give birth to large-brained and fairly helpless infants who are dependent for a longer period of time. And we wean these infants earlier long before they are nutritionally independent and can provision themselves. It's been estimated that it requires nearly 13 million kilocalories to raise one single infant from birth to nutritional independence. Such requirements go far beyond what a mother can procure alone. As human mothers wean their infants before they're nutritionally independent, they're able to resume their ovulation sooner and have subsequent offspring more rapidly, effectively shortening the interbirth interval. But this means that human moms are faced with a unique problem. 
of providing care to unweaned infants while simultaneously maintaining economic production to successfully feed all of their older children. So they, in essence, stack their children. This challenging task of taking care of multiple dependent offspring with various needs is one of the distinct features of being a human mother, something that other apes don't contend with. So the question is, how did this life history evolve in our species? How did our foremothers do it? The answer is that they did it with help. This form of child rearing and of reproduction um, can be called cooperative breeding. A reproductive system where group, mothers, group members, other than the biological parents or alloparents, aid in the care and provisioning of young. The use of this term to describe this aspect of human reproduction was introduced by Sarah Hurdy in her book, Mothers and Others, which was first published in 2009. The cooperative breeding hypothesis proposes that apes, with the life history attributes of Homo sapiens, could not have evolved unless allo mothers had this help, this assistance in caring for and provisioning their young. More recently, other scholars have offered alternative terms to describe the human-specific pattern of cooperation and the provisioning and care of young, but the concept remains similar to or the same as the concept that Hurdy originally proposed. Hurdy has gone on to argue that this unusual mode of rearing young generated novel ape phenotypes, subsequently subjected to directional selection that favored those infants who were better at monitoring the mental states of others, so successfully eliciting care from caregivers or potential caregivers. And the result was an ape who was already socially intelligent, who was emotionally and cognitively pre-adapted for the evolution of higher levels of cooperation. The evolutionary outcome is that humans have been selected to be pro-social as helpers in a cooperative breeding system. And the period of human infancy has also come under selection pressures for skills of social cognition and communication, something that's been argued by Sarah Hurdy, Kristen Hawkes, and others. The cooperative breeding hypothesis has, over the past decade, since Hurdy published Mothers and Others, had an incredible impact on the scholarship being produced in a wide range of disciplines, ranging from neuroscience to human biology to social psychology. Scholars are now reframing the ways in which they think about the evolution of parenting and the evolution of cooperation in light of the cooperative breeding hypothesis. Much of my own work over the past 10 years has tested the cooperative breeding hypothesis looking to see how many individuals help a mother and under what conditions. I work among a small-scale foraging population, the Hadza of Tanzania. The community who I work with are still hunting and gathering for a significant portion of their diet. They practice distributed childcare, they live in small groups and are semi-nomadic, and thus represent an ideal population in which to study patterns of allo-maternal investment. You can see my field site located on the screen with a pop-out map. Um, my field site, I tend to work east of Lake Yasi. You can see the yellow highlighted portion um, just east of Lake Yasi there. And those are the camps that I've been working in um, since 2004. So one of the first questions that I wanted to ask was, who cares for Hadza children? So we recorded the percent of time that infants were being held and by whom. Using data collected over 17 months of field work, and 42,000 instantaneous scan observations where we monitored what people were doing in camp, we analyzed the patterns of infant holding of 470 individuals, 234 females and 236 males. 185 of these individuals were recorded holding infants. 46 of these were mothers, and 139 of them were allo mothers. And we found that the total time that Hadza children were held 69% of that total time, they were held by their mother, and 31% of the time by allo mothers, who ranged in age from one and a half to 79 years old. After mothers, fathers were next in line, in terms of who spent the most time holding infants, followed by older sisters and then grandmothers. And interestingly, when controlling for residents, when a focal infant had both a maternal and a paternal grandmother residing in camp, we found no significant difference in the amount of time that the infant was held by either grandmother. 
We also found that across holders of all ages, females spent more time holding than their male counterparts. Juveniles, children, ranging in age from 1.5 up through um, being juvenile and adolescents up to 18 years, represented 62% of the total population of ALA mothers. Children were held by related individuals significantly more often than by unrelated individuals, and interestingly, a higher degree of genetic relatedness between the holders and the child associated with the higher mean percent of time being held. And interestingly, above the age of weaning, we found that a decrease in the frequency of maternal holding correlated with a higher rate of allo maternal holding, meaning that care that was provided by these allo mothers decreased the amount of time that mothers spent holding their child thus releasing her to perform other activities. Given how much ALA maternal assistance children were providing to mothers by way of childcare, I wanted to explore how economically productive Hadza children might be. I was interested in seeing if Hadza children were able to offset some of the cost of their own care. So we collected 70 days of food collection and foraging data on 34 children ranging in age from 3 to 17 years of age, and we found that Hadza kids are avid foragers, something we've known for a long time. Hadza child economic productivity is one of the most well-studied aspects of Hadza ethnography. They collect a wide range of food. Children focus their collection efforts on fruit, like baobab, berries, figs. They focus their um, foraging efforts on birds, on tubers, on honey, small game, like hyrax, bush mice, and galagos, and also collect droops and legumes. Several of the children in our sample were able to meet at least half of their daily caloric requirements above the age of five years, a finding that confirmed work done by Nicholas Blurton Jones, Kristen Hawks, and Jim O'Connell. And we also found that boys consume much more while out foraging than girls who appear to eat less while out collecting food, yet bring home more to share with the group. We also recently analyzed around 17,000 scan observations of how children spend their time. And we reanalyzed the foraging return data and then correlated it with total foraging energy expenditure calculated with the BMI of each participant. And here you can see the total foraging um, energy expenditure for each individual child, males on the left and females on the right. And we found that almost every foraging trip resulted in a caloric surplus over the energy expended during foraging. In males, the average caloric surplus was around 2,000 kilocalories, and in females, the caloric surplus was around 700 kilocalories. But we know from previous work that the boys are eating their surplus often um, while they are out foraging. Given that some children are collecting a surplus above and beyond the energetic costs of collecting food, and we found that many children are returning to camp with food to share, we wanted to find out who these children were sharing their food with. Over the past decade, many researchers have argued that our species has been organized through much of our evolutionary history into partially kin-based resource acquisition and consumption units, and that this is part of the cooperative breeding matrix. So my colleagues and I set out to analyze the food sharing patterns of Hadza children. I collected naturalistic foraging data on 62 meals over 36 days, which amounted to 128 instances of dyadic food sharing. And we then constructed a data frame with all sharing dyads and the total log kilocalories shared by each child and to whom. And we found that starting in middle childhood, around seven years old, children began increasing their frequency of sharing. And the trend continued, so that the oldest kids in the sample were sharing the most frequently and in the greatest amount. We didn't find any sex differences, however, in the amount of food shared among children um, of these ages. And I also have a map here um, of who the children in each of our study camps shared food with. As you can see, it's pretty messy. There was a lot of reciprocation in the amount of food shared between partners, but not, interestingly, in the frequency. So the amount over time seemed to be fairly reciprocal. Sharing did not appear to be biased towards kin, and we did have several instances where kids shared food with the adults in the household particularly if parents were injured or cognitively impaired and were not as productive as other adult foragers in their camp. So what do the, all of these data tell us? They suggest that children among the Hadza are certainly offsetting the cost of their own care. While children are being provisioned, they're also actively contributing to their own caloric needs, and in some cases, sharing food with other children, and sometimes with their parents and grandparents. 
Karen Kramer has long argued that this type of intergenerational transfer of food is a critical and often overlooked component of cooperative breeding. So where does all of this leave us? In the last decade, research on cooperative breeding in humans has exploded. I searched Google Scholar last night to make sure that I had an accurate number for you today. And if you select just the last decade, from 2009 to 2019, and use the key terms cooperative breeding in humans, you retrieve 22,700 citations. So as of 2019, what do we know? We know that cooperative breeding, or child rearing, characterizes most of the world's cultures. We know that mothers rely on a wide constellation of caregivers, including older children. We know, uh, what we think we know, I should say, is that a human mother's best reproductive strategy is likely a flexible one. And what this means is kind of both now and in our evolutionary, evolutionary past, where she was able to rely on various forms of social support to assist her in provisioning and raising her offspring. We also think we know that cooperative breeding has deep evolutionary roots and is a key attribute in the evolution of our species. And we think we know that juveniles are an important part of the human cooperative breeding matrix. At least I think I know that, and I think others would agree with me. What we need to know, there's a lot that we need to know. We need to know the cost of investment in subsidizing children. We need to know much more about metabolic energy allocation during adolescence. And things I haven't mentioned here, uh, we need to know a lot more specifically about diet composition as the Hadza are changing and how early nutrition transition as they're moving away from a diet of foraged foods is impacting the decisions and choices that not only child foragers are making, but also moms in this rapidly changing ecosystem. In the end, what I can say over the last 10 years of work being done on cooperative breeding and how it relates to parenting and child development is that important work is being done and will continue to be done. And I'm eager to see what the next decade of research uncovers. For now, we can end with the idea that it appears that the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child has very deep evolutionary roots. Thank you.